Look around, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. Look around, look around. Well, maybe not lucky. I would never say we're lucky to have MS. I would not wish MS on anyone. But I would say that we're very fortunate to be living with it now on the cusp of 2025. I love markers in time. While I try to live in the present, I do like looking back and looking forward. As we head into 2025, I'd like to look a bit at the history of MS, take a moment to look at recent changes in diagnosing and treating MS, and take a peek at what we might see in the future. Spoiler alert, there's a lot to be optimistic about. First, a bit of history. People have been showing signs of a disease that could be MS as early as the 1300s, but it wasn't until 1868 that Jean-Martin Charcot gave a lecture on the features of MS and gave it a name. Charcot has often been called the father of modern neurology, and he inspired Sigmund Freud. There were some early attempts at treating MS symptoms with things like arsenic and mercury and the injection of malaria parasites. Fast forward to 1951, when steroids were first used to help people with MS when they had relapses. The steroids helped to quell the inflammation and acute attacks, but sadly, they didn't alter the progression of MS. They did help to reduce the severity of the relapse and shorten the duration of the relapses, though, so that's good. Steroids are still used today to help during a relapse to relieve symptoms and to help us get past our relapses faster. The first treatment specifically for MS was approved by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., in 1993. Yes, 1993. I know, it seems crazy to me, too, that the first drugs to treat MS only came on the market just over 30 years ago. Diagnosing MS has also changed. Early on, it was strictly looking at symptoms. In the 1960s, there was the Schumacher criteria, which required two or more central nervous system abnormalities separated by time and space. People would need to have documented the relapse symptoms with a doctor. In 1983, the POSER criteria added EVO potentials and spinal fluid analysis. EVO potentials are when they measure how long it takes the brain to respond to sensory stimuli. They attach sensors to the scalp and they test the speed of the nerves. When our nerves or our myelin are damaged or scarred, it could take longer for the signals to get through. And the spinal fluid analysis looks for specific proteins and antibodies that can indicate the possible presence of MS, particularly the presence of oligoclonal bands. These are bands of immunoglobulins that appear when the person's spinal fluid is analyzed. They are produced by B lymphocytes and indicate ongoing inflammation in the central nervous system. In 1984, MRIs became available to help diagnose MS. Again, it wasn't that long ago. I am amazed at how fast things have changed in our lifetimes. MRIs are magnetic resonance imaging systems. It's an imaging technique that uses radio waves and a large magnet to create detailed images of the inside of our bodies. This allows the doctors to see abnormalities in our tissues. In 2000, the McDonald criteria emphasized the importance of MRI evidence in establishing the MS diagnosis. The McDonald criteria has been revised a few times since then, with the latest revision happening just this year in 2024. The latest update includes specifications on lesions, because MS lesions look different than other brain lesions. I'll put a link below to an article that goes over the history of the McDonald criteria if you'd like to check it out. There's still no definitive test for MS, but diagnosing has come a long way in recent years, and we're able to be diagnosed quicker and with more accuracy so they can start treatments sooner. Research consistently shows that getting early recognition and accurate diagnosis of MS are critical to delay disease progression as much as possible and improve patients' outcomes. Speaking of treatments, Let's take a moment to be grateful for the number of treatments available to us today. More than 20 disease-modifying therapies have been approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to treat the different types of MS. More than 20! This is such great news for us. 
If we're on a treatment that doesn't seem to be working, we have options, lots of them. We can work with our neurologist and health team to determine which would be best for us. Remember, just over 30 years ago, there were no treatments. There's also great news in other ways of treating and managing MS. Have you heard of neuroplasticity? It's the brain's ability to change and adapt throughout life by changing its structure and connections. There are several things that affect neuroplasticity, such as exercise, diet, and sleep. Rehabilitation of motor function is a major component of MS management that is supported by neuroplasticity, i.e. the brain's ability to adapt to MS damage or disability. How freaking cool is that? It really wasn't that long ago that we thought the brain was static, and once the damage was done, that was it. The damage was permanent. In recent years, there have been more and more studies and papers reporting on neuroplasticity and how it can help people with MS. In this review, they state, it is clear that physical activity and MS has a positive influence, and it has become increasingly clear that physical activity has a major effect on brain reorganization as well. And neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to modify itself at a structural and functional level. Our brains can change and improve based on lifestyle modifications. There are things that we can do to improve. There are many physical therapists that specialize in MS that are showing great results for people with MS, and part of that's neuroplasticity. When we repeatedly work on functional exercises, we are helping our brains to find new neural pathways to help us move better. There are three MS-specific physical therapy channels that have free content that I really like. The Missing Link with Dr. Gretchen Holly, the MS Gym, and MS Workouts. And I'll put links to all three in the description below. The next bit of good news is that we're continuing to see research that shows diet and lifestyle changes can help us to improve our MS symptoms too. Eating a more whole food plant-based diet is consistently showing that it improves two of our most troubling symptoms, fatigue and cog fog, both of which are cited as leading reasons that people with MS leave the workforce. Observational studies are showing it helps with overall quality of life too, and I'll link some of these studies and papers below if you'd like to check them out. Exercising as we're able, getting good sleep, and practicing mindfulness also help to manage our symptoms. I can tell you from my experience, it's true. I'm 18 plus years into my journey with MS and I'm still doing well. There's also great news when it comes to possible new treatments. Did you know that it takes an average of 10 to 15 years to develop and gain approval for a new drug? But there are so many that are in phase two and phase three trials in the UK and US right now. Look at all these drugs that are in development right now. They include drugs for relapsing remitting MS, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, and even some on remyelination. More on that later. And there are a couple that I'd like to highlight. The octopus trial is a multi-site, multi-arm study assessing alpha-lipoic acid and metformin in patients with progressive multiple sclerosis. And it was reported at Ectrums, a large conference about MS, in September that it's progressing well. There's also the BTK inhibitors trial that's now in phase three. There are some mixed results, but there are ongoing trials that they may become an option for those with progressive forms of MS. There's also some exciting research going on around remyelination, which could be a game changer when it comes to treating relapses. There's a new drug called PIPE307 that targets an elusive receptor on certain cells in the brain that prompts them to mature into myelin-producing oligodendrocytes. Once the receptor is blocked, the oligodendrocytes spring into action, wrapping themselves around the axons and forming new myelin sheaths. That would be amazing. They've been working on this for 10 years, and it recently passed phase one trials and is currently in phase two trials on humans. Living with MS is hard. It is freaking hard, but I've always been a glasses half full and refillable kind of girl. There's always hope. There are amazing treatments. There's more coming, 
and there are things that we can do to help ourselves live well with it. As we come to the close of 2024, I'm excited to see what the future brings. What do you think? Is there reason to be hopeful? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. To see more on how to live well with MS, watch these videos next. If you'd like more information from me, including recipes on whole food plant-based meals, be sure to sign up for my newsletter using the link below. Until next time, be well.